When the Democratic Republicans took power, they spoke of the election as a revolution. Jefferson said this revolution was a real revolution and the principles of our government as that of 1776 was in its form. Those in the Jefferson administration wanted to do things differently from their predecessors. The predecessors had copied the British monarchy. Jefferson encouraged Congress to get rid of the Alien and Sedation Acts. He also wanted to get rid of taxes on things like stamps, land, and other things. He wanted to retire the national debt by paying it down. When he first got into office, the price of debt was $80 million. By the time he left, it was at $57 million. He made extreme cuts to the Army and Navy and streamlined the government bureaucracy. He also increased the sale of federal lands. These two revenues drove down the federal debt. Although Jefferson was very wealthy and educated, he recognized the popularity of common style. A friend of his described his work to be old fashioned, but it was always done by the finest materials. He was a very educated man and it was very simple. As well as him having great manners, his victory of the election of 1800 was considered a revolution. Around the same time that Thomas Jefferson had taken presidency, his cousin John Marshall had became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Although them being cousins, they were political enemies. When it came to going westward, Jefferson insisted that having farm ownership would help freedom. We needed to expand due to the rapid growth of population. To avoid war, Jefferson wanted to buy the New Orleans from the French. The rebels defeated the French army and suppressed them. With no army, the Louisiana needed money to fight the British. Therefore, Napoleon decided to sell the Louisiana territory. This later became known as the Louisiana Purchase. This was an extreme amount of land that the US only bought for $15 million. Jefferson had sent William Clark and Meriwether Louise to explore this new territory. This later became known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. They were guided by a woman called Sacagawea and her husband most of this trip. There was a conflict in North Africa. The Babari states of North Africa were seizing American ships and profiting over them. Adams and Washington had paid protection and Jefferson was about to do this until they upped their prices. Jefferson had sent a small American Navy to blockade the port of Tripoli where they were concluding the Babari War. Fast forward to Jefferson's embargo, Jefferson had tried to persuade Congress into declaring an embargo. By doing this, he thought that this would close down the British factories, but instead the British just found another factory to work at. He lifted the embargo right before his retirement from presidency. He was succeeded by his friend, James Madison. James Madison had defeated a Federalist rival in the election of 1808. And that's it for Jefferson as president. In the start of the 1800s, the newly formed United States began to industrialize this nation. The first man to bring these ideas was Samuel Slade, or commonly known as the father of the Industrial Revolution. After moving from Great Britain to the United States, he used his detailed knowledge to build America's first factory. This factory was used in the textile industry. After him, many other people developed industrial systems. For example, Eli Whitney. He founded the idea of an interchangeable parts. Interchangeable parts were identical parts being made that can freely replace others after being broken. Also, another invention being made was the turnpike, which is a road users had to pay to use. But turnpikes failed. They, people didn't make much of a profit out of them, so they resort, resorted to the National Road, which is a gateway that extended west from the Maryland to the Ohio River. Another invention was steamboats. These machines made traveling on water more efficiently and easier, and were powered by steam power. All these inventions seemed great, but there was a toll. This toll was that city conditions lowered, sickness was commonly around cities, and life expectancy dropped. Overall, the Industrial Revolution, it lowered people's living conditions, but also gave a lot of more people jobs and made working easier. Our new and first ever President of the United States, George Washington, was just recently inaugurated into the White House with Vice President John Adams by his side. Washington has many plans for this country, such as one that was just recently passed, which is the Judiciary Act. This act establishes Supreme Court and has established 13 federal district courts. On another note, the leader of the Federalist, Alexander Hamilton, is in charge of our nation's finances. Now, seeing as our nation is in a $52 million debt, Hamilton has been thinking of a lot of ideas 
to pay off those debts, such as creating a more commercial and industrial economy to cut the nation's debt. And he also suggested that we should make people pay more taxes in order to pay off our nation. Many do not believe that everyone must pay taxes because it's mainly only northern states that are in debt and it would be unfair and unjust for southern states to have to pay for the northerners' debt. Nonetheless, Congress has passed a law and has made everyone pay taxes. Just recently, a war broke out. Two political parties, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist, they recently named this war the Whiskey Rebellion. The Federalists fought for a strong central government and the Anti-Federalists want states to have the power. The Federalists won the war and Anti-Federalists did not. Following the war, John Adams has stepped up as president and has passed Alien and Sedition Acts, which is allowing immigrants and those who question the law to be prosecuted. Although he passed this act, many were not pleased with Adams' presidency, and soon after he became president, Jefferson would step up and become the third president of the United States. Hi, this is Sophia, and we are continuing our broadcast with the War of 1812. It was between the United States and Great Britain. It lasted from 1812 to 1815. It all started in 1809, when Congress replaced the embargo with the Non-Intercourse Act after Great Britain's constant abuses in 1809. The Non-Intercourse Act stated that trade between the U.S. and Britain or France would resume when they removed the restrictions on U.S. shipping. The following year, which was 1810, Congress made Macon's Bill No. 2. Macon's Bill No. 2 restored trade with both Britain and France. However, it also promised that if either Britain or France recognized American neutrality, then the U.S. would resume trading sanctions against the other country. James Madison ordered sanctions against the British when France agreed to withdraw decrees against American shipping. President Madison urged Congress to declare war on Britain in June of 1812 after being humiliated by British interference with American trade and presence and support for American Indian attacks on settlers. Even though the war deeply divided the nation, James Madison won the re-election later that year. Then, once again, the United States went into war, but this time with Canada. Jefferson urged that with the population of 8 million, the United States would easily conquer Canada, which only had 250,000 people. But he was later proven wrong when Canada repeatedly defeated the American invasion attempts in 1812 and 1813. Today marks a revolutionary day in American history, for today is June 21st of the year 1788. The Constitution has become the official framework of the government of the United States of America when New Hampshire became the ninth of 13 states to ratify it. The journey of ratification has been a long and a druidish process. Until the new Constitution was ratified, the country was governed by the Articles of Confederation. This document was tailored for a newly formed nation made from states acting as independent sovereign countries instead of one united nation. But quickly, it has been clear to most American leaders that change is needed for the future to stabilize and reinforce the new, more centralized government. New York's Alexander Hamilton thus led the call for the Constitutional Convention to reevaluate the nation's governing document. The Confederal Congress has endorsed his initiative, and representatives from all 13 states were subsequently invited to Covina in Philadelphia on May 25, 1787, to participate in the convention.